There's an important ingredient to our magic that we often add either too much or too little in. A certain amount of devotion that is required from us that we either neglect entirely or, oh, put we way too much time and effort into. I'm not talking about the gods or our guides or various spirits we work with. I'm not even talking about the almighty God themselves. What about you? When was the last time you thought about honoring yourself in your practice? Because it's important. Let's talk about that today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie. I am a Christo Pagan Druid and priest of Bridget. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian. I am a Christo Pagan Druid and sous chef to the doctor. Today, we're going to be talking about kind of a complex topic. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. Self-love, self-care, self-esteem, all of those things. Self-improvement. We did touch on it. On an earlier episode, somewhat, when we talked about humility. Don't worry, this isn't really a touchy-feely subject. This is a very practical, hands-on kind of a thing. Because it's kind of the root of our practice. And if we get it wrong, it will taint everything else. But before we get into that, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on whatever app you're currently listening to us on. really does help us out. Plus, we do original Christo Pagan and Druid content five days a week, Monday through Friday on this podcast, and you don't want to miss a thing. Alrighty, well, let's get into it. Honoring yourselves is hard. At least it's hard for me. I have talked about my past a little bit. I grew up in a world with zero self-esteem. Self-esteem was not encouraged, allowed, tolerated. Put your head down, get the work done, nothing else matters. And it was, it was tricksy to learn to do better. That's why I was going to give a quick recap on humility, because humility is all about occupying the space that you're supposed to occupy in the time that you're in that space. It changes. It's flexible. It's about learning that balance. It's very much the middle way in that sense, because there are times when we're supposed to occupy more space, and there are times when we're supposed to yield that space to others. It's really tricky to learn that it's something you have to feel out because honestly, we should not be telling anybody that they need to occupy less space. That's problematic. Even if you're right. <laughs> Even if you're right. Even if you're right. Don't say it. Don't, just don't say don't it. Say it. Trust me as somebody who used to say it a lot. That is, it's, it's never it's not end well for anybody involved. So how do, how do you get started? How to figure out if you are occupying the right amount of space, how to figure all this stuff? Well, one, is every sentence out of your mouth start with the word I? There's a wonderful practice in Israel Regardi's one-year manual. I think it's what it's currently being published as. It's what it was when I bought it, but they've changed the name of the book. I think it's still called that. Where we're starting to develop our sense of self and we're starting to deal with that. If you're not familiar with this book, it's a one-year practice where you take up a specific practice for an entire month. And by the end, you do all 12 practices. One of the months... We are developing our will, and to do so, you can't use first-person pronouns for a month. And you can't get around using first-person pronouns by talking about yourself in the third person. The practice was very difficult. Yes. It, everyone finds, even somebody like me, who doesn't speak well of themselves very often, who has a lot of self-esteem issues, I found it a difficult task to do. And that's one of the reasons why it's chosen, because the amount of self-will that you have to develop to not say I, me, my, we, our for a month. And trust me, I, when I first, when this Charlie first pitched doing this practice, I was like, oh, it's easy. I got it in the bag. I can do this. And then I stopped and went, oh, I already failed twice. Whoops. And I tried, failed again. And it had to keep trying and trying. And it, it, it was, yeah, it was tricky. It, it's eventually got there, but... And it's not a permanent practice. It's not something yeah. that you do forever, as you can tell, because we're both using first-person pronouns. Yeah. But it's a good way to, one, develop just your willpower, but also to start realizing how much space you are taking up. Because some of the things that I noticed about this is there were certain groups of friends that I used I, me, my a lot around, 
There were certain f- groups of friends that I used we, us, our a lot around. And a third group of friends that I just never really did any of that. And those quickly became not my friends. Because there was no we, us, or our. And there wasn't even space for me, my, and mine. Yeah, those weren't good people to be about. I learned a lot to this practice. It's an interesting one to try if you would like to. I, I do like that book. The Sun Salutations I did differently, but that's a whole other story. When you're work, working on this project and learning to honor yourself, we're not advocating for any kind of narcissism. And we're not arguing for some kind of self-negation. As with most things in the magical arts or even the mystical arts, you're actually working towards some kind of a middle ground, somewhere in the in-between. That is, middle path is always vital. This is where I found a lot of power in the story of Siddhartha for honoring oneself. Because when Siddhartha started out, they engaged in both extremes and found that it was all about this balance, finding that harmony, that balance, as they phrase it, the middle way. And the the power that came from the magic that was in that story to reference back to yesterday's episode was very helpful because it is so much in honoring yourself when it comes to eating. We have to eat for nourishment, but we should also eat for pleasure. It's about balancing and, and finding that middle way because we don't want to go to extremes in either direction. If we're not getting the proper nutrients, we're not going to be as healthy as we could be. We're not going to be as strong as we could be. And we're not honoring ourselves. Same thing with exercise and stuff, because everyone, most of us like to look at ourselves and wish we were in a different shape than we were in. It's okay to want to be in a different shape and to go through the steps in the process, but you have to honor yourself in accepting what you can do and what you can't do. Yes. Because some have physical limitations. They, they may have had uh, injuries. All the bodies are so different. They all have different limitations. It's about honoring and accepting that, living within and occupying that space which you are meant to occupy. So in most magical practices, you'll hear talk about our holy guardian angel. This is not what a lot of people think it is. This is not a guardian angel in the Christian context of a ministering spirit sent from heaven to take care of you. In these more ceremonial magical traditions, it's actually a representation of your higher self. It is the best that you could be. And the goal of a lot of these practices is to meet that guardian angel, to meet that holy angelic guardian, and to have relationship with it. In the fairy practice, we have something similar. We believe that everyone has a fetch. A fetch is a co-walker, a spirit that often looks like you, a twin of you from the other folk, a member of the other crowd who follows you your entire life. And they experience life vicariously through you. Now, the reason I bring this up is when you're trying to connect to this image of yourself, this honoring of self, if you have a hard time with that understanding of why should I be honored? Why am I worthy of honoring? A devotion or a practice dedicated to either your holy guardian angel or your fetch may be a good place to start. I do believe that some people have both. I, well, most people I believe have both. You have an idealized self and you have a guardian spirit that comes with you. I have done both the guardian angel practices and the fetch practices, and they are two very different spirits that I have encountered doing that. When you are working at either your co-walker who is living this life with you, one, just knowing that you have a co-walker, a spirit that is literally living with you throughout this life to experience life vicariously through you. If you weren't worth the time, energy, and effort, they would leave. And they don't. They don't and they won't. They they may get a little testy at times. I think a lot of poltergeist activity is people's fetch being angry at them for not listening or not paying attention or doing things that are harmful or self-destructive, they're going to stay with you. They, they are tied to you for this life. You are worthy of having a spirit do that. There is an ideal version of you. It is your angelic guardian. By reaching out and having devotion for it, you are having devotion to your ideal self, the person that you are working towards becoming, that ideal you that you will one day be. That's a simple might be the best way to put it, way to get started. 
with us. It's not about sitting around telling yourself daily affirmations, though you may need that. I know I do. I, I have a very constant, I guess would be the best word. I almost said persistent, but that has different connotations of that word. A very constant practice of saying various slogans to myself. It's a practice that I picked up when I was practicing Buddhism that you treat them like mantras. There are things that you need to know, things that are true. There are truisms that you just repeat to yourself, things that you need to practice, things that you need to do, things that you need to know. And I, I do kind of have that. I'm good enough, smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, because that is the hardest thing for me to personally understand. If you need to do that, do that. Everyone's going to be starting from a different place when it comes to honoring the self. And you need to be honest clear and direct about where you are in this process. Some people have way too much ego. Some people do not have enough ego. Some people are downright narcissistic. Part of their self-honoring needs to be in diminishing their affection and self-focus. And to blow your mind, sometimes people can have too much ego and not enough at the exact same time. Same time. Because it's complicated. <laughs> it's all complicated. And everybody's different. That's okay. So you have to evaluate where you are. Now, we can talk about self-care. I think that self-care really does play into honoring yourself. But beyond that, I don't think it hurts for us to ritualize this. Influence. Not at all. Not at all. And that, once again, that's, it's remembering that when working the magics, you're working the subtle energies. And those subtle energies manifest in many, many different ways. So you have the neural energies. you got to rework those, those brain pathways and the energies in your head. And how they work and you need to work all the other subtle energies in your life and ritual practice is great for that the magic of storytelling is great for that yes grounding would be the obvious first place to start connect connect so many of our problems with our self-image and how we relate and to relate with the world is born out of a detachment that our modern late stage capitalist world really tries to instill in us from a very young age. Learning to ground yourself, to take just a few deep breaths and feel your connection to the earth below and the sky above, and that can be as elaborate or as simple as you want or need it to be, helps you to start understanding where you fit in to this world. Because I think that is the source of a lot of the problems that people have, both with their lives and with their magical practices, is that they have grown detached. They have an ironic, sarcastic view towards everything. And they have neglected any honest or earnest experiences because everything has to be cloaked in this irony. That detachment is very subtle and insidious as well. For instance, with myself, sometimes I have bad eating habits and it is during detachment. I will get hyper-focused when I'm enjoying something really yummy. And through that hyper-focus, I end up focusing in on enjoying what I'm eating so much that I detach the signals my body is giving myself when I am full, when I don't need to eat anymore. And so I will just eat and eat and eat and become ravenous almost in this rapturous experience, which is okay to have. The experience itself is okay. It's okay to get caught up in a rapturous experience of eating something that is just amazingly yummy or, or amazingly fun to eat. But once again, you have to be careful because that detachment is where I, that's where I fall into folly with that. And I have to remind myself and work on in honoring myself, oh, you know, allowing myself to experience the moment, but not to detach the signals from my body and not to detach from everything else around me so that I know, okay, I'm, I need to slow down in my eating. I need to stop eating. <laughs> I live in my brain. I want to say I live in my mind, and I do partially, but I, I live in my brain. Like the place in my body where my consciousness spends most of its time it is, is, is in my brain. It doesn't even get out into the rest of my body that much. Like what are my legs doing? What are my knees doing? What, what are my arms doing? Just to kind of live inside my head. And learning basic grounding helps to remind me of my interconnectedness. Learning to do things like the light body practice, which we have a version of on our YouTube channel and on our sister podcast, uh, the Hollister can really help you to get out of your head and into your body and reminding yourself that you 
can do things other than just sit and think, which is something that I, I do have to remind myself that I can do because I'm a thinker. I, I get very lost in thought and yeah, the idea, oh, I could get up and go do something just doesn't occur to me. And so I have to make an effort to remind myself that is a thing that I can do. Other ways to honor yourself could be ritualizing certain activities. This is, I think, what the Sabbath is really good for. I very vigorously defend my Sabbath. I take a Sabbath every Saturday. I do not check my email on Saturday. I will not get back to anybody about any work, anything on a Saturday. I allow myself to have free reign, to play, to have fun, to goof off. We hang out with friends. It is a day of just all of the other obligations that are normally placed upon me. I free myself of them. Well, that is part of that honoring yourself is that balance between the works that we're trying to do in our lives and honoring ourselves by allowing ourselves to have that rest. We need the rest so that we can be more effective in the work that we do. And that is what's so great about that, like a Sabbath ritual. Having a full day of rest, that's all it's for. Rest, recuperation, and self-care, that, that's it. it. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Remembering to include yourself in your rituals. I get how flashy and fancy it is when you first start learning magic to be like, oh, you can call on magic. You can call on spirits. You can call on angels. You can call on these various divine beings and da da da. And it's flashy and it's sometimes necessary. But most of the magic that you will need to do should come from you. When you're making your coffee, when you're making your tea, that's personal magic. Hey, you might have some guides that want to help with that and put a little booster in it. Nothing wrong with that, but that's part of you. That's your work. That's something that should originate with you. If you are, I hate this analogy and I also love it. If magic to you is spiritual Pokemon, where you're just collecting spirits so that you can throw them out into various battles to do work for you. One, that's not good relationships with any of the spirits that you're in. If the only time you ever deal with them or interact with them is when you need something, and we've talked about that before, but it's neglecting, one, the power that you have innately within you, and it's preventing you from building up that power and those reserves within yourself because intention is a muscle. Willpower is a muscle. I don't even know what to call it. There's a certain magical om that is a muscle. And once you start doing the intention and the willpower stuff, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's this other third thing that I, I to refer to just energy work. Yeah. Energy work, the energy work, <laughs> but it's, it, it, it in yeah. itself is a muscle. What I mean by that is it gets stronger through use, gets weaker through disuse. If you're not taking the time and energy to do that, you're not going to get to the places that you want to go because you are just relying quite literally on the kindness of others to get you through. And yeah, sometimes we really do need to call on our guides and guardians and whatnot to help us with some of the bigger things or even some of the simple things. It's not wrong to ask for help, but if every time you're making a tea, you have to invoke every healing, health, energy, being that you know to empower that brew, what, why, what, what? No, that is a waste of your time and their time. And it's something that you will start noticing. Most spirits have personalities. And if you're constantly over there going, me, 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 I need you to do this. I need you to do this. And not developing a relationship with them and always asking for silly things, they will start to ignore you. As I like to say, think about it in your own life. Most of us, when somebody comes to us for something, we want to help. And if we have it in our ability to do so, we'll help them. And we'll help them every time they ask. But I, after a while, you know, most those people in your life are always asking for help and it's like weird dumb things or something. After a while, you kind of go, that's a dumb thing. And then you just kind of get annoyed with them. And oftentimes you're still polite, but you start avoiding them and not hanging out as much. And you know, it's just like, I, as I like to say, don't be that person. So your honoring of self will be very individualistic. You've heard Brian and I talking about ours a little bit. Most of mine actually involves my fetch work where I am working with my coworker who is very stern with me because I need to be better about not thinking so little of myself. 
which is a constant struggle for me, but that's the form that mine takes. Your work with your co-walker, if you choose to take up that practice, may be completely different. Your practice will not be identical to mine or anyone else's. And you need to find those things that are healing to you, that are recuperative to you, that are honoring to you. If it is honoring to journal, journal. Journal every day, whenever you need to, do it. If that's something that you find draining, I still think you should journal when you're doing magical actions because it's good to see I did a working for this and this is the result I got. That's where every working we do is an experiment. So that kind of journaling is very important. But yeah, if, if journaling saps your soul, that's the only journal you need to keep. It's just your experiment log. Find out what honors you. Telling stories is something that I find very much an expression of myself and something that I feel that honor, that self-worth, that appreciation in. Even if I'm just writing stories that I'm not even sharing with other people. And so that's my practice. I think you find this a lot in cooking. Yeah. You're going to find different ways to honor yourself. That aspect can be summarized as your creative acts. Yeah. As part of honoring yourself is engaging in the act of creation. And it's very different for each person, each different practitioner. But finding that which you're passionate about and you get that joy out of creating and then incorporating that into hopefully your daily life. You really want to be able to do that every day. But if you have to, starting out, make time each week. Yeah. Even if, even if you just go, this is part of my Sabbath, this is taking some time. And remember, it's nice if your Sabbath can be the same day of the week every week, but, you know, late stage capitalism, if it has to be a moving Sabbath. Oh, as I like to say, the Sabbath was made for us, so it's going to be whatever day you need it to be on that works with you. And, yeah, because bodies are, work nicely off these rhythms and patterns, having it consistent is wonderful, but some of us don't have, we have flexible schedules that change week to week, and... It's okay just going, this is my day off, so this will be my Sabbath. And it works. So I would love to know, how do you honor yourself? Because each and every one of you listening to my voice, you need to understand you are good enough. You are worth the effort. Everyone is. And most of the problems that we have in this world are from people who don't honor themselves. And they're just out there constantly trying to hoard or collect or have. And there's no... It's very mine, mine, mine. And we tend to think of it as me, 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 but it's not actually me, me, me. It's mine, 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 because they're afraid of or just neglectful of doing any work on themselves. So yeah, how are you honoring yourself? I would love to know, especially if there's any little thing that you do that just brings a little sparkle into your life that you would like to share in the comments. That would be amazing. You can leave a comment if you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say that you can leave a comment, they won't let us know, but you can leave a comment there anyway, because engagement is magic. And then head on over to creationspast.com slash chat, where you can leave us a comment there and we will be able to see it and respond to you while you're there. If you have any money, you can pass our way. You can think about joining a membership. You can also support us on Patreon or Ko-fi. I and CE Dorset on both. That money really does help us keep the lights on keep a roof over our heads and keep food on our tables. So thank you to everybody who does that. It really does help out more than, you know, and on our way out talking to St. Michael a lot here, but I have a very strong devotion to St. Michael. So one more time. Oh, St. Michael, the archangel, the archangel of compassion, remind us to have compassion for ourselves because in having compassion for ourselves, we learn how to be compassionate towards others. Help us to find that love and that honor that we all deserve. Amen. Amen.